oil. Drillers go bust for it. Nations go to war for it. Nobody can get enough. From a single 50-foot derrick to platform cities taller than the tallest buildings. It's a high-risk gamble that can make you a billionaire or ruin your life. Now, passion, luck, and science in the search for black gold on Modern Marvels. In the early 1600s, when European explorers first entered the wooded hills of western Pennsylvania, they found something they'd never encountered before, a black oozing substance that seeped up from the ground in viscous bubbles. The local Indians touted the substance as a folk medicine cure-all for everything from burns to broken bones. They also used it to caulk their canoes. Native Americans were not the first to make use of this natural resource. The walls of Jericho were held together with oil-based tar as mortar. And according to the Bible, Noah applied two coats of tar to the outside of the ark to make it watertight. Oil had been formed over millions of years from prehistoric plant and animal life that decayed and was compressed under great pressure but it wasn't until the 1850s that it burst forth into the modern world and triggered a revolution. The man who launched this revolution was a New York lawyer with an entrepreneurial flair named George Bissell. He had seen how Pennsylvania oil was collected from the surface and used in medicinal elixirs popular at the time. Rub it on wounds, cuts, abrasions, rashes, pimples, sores, scratches, and other afflictions of the epidermis. But Bissell had another idea for this miracle substance. Could oil, he wondered, be somehow harnessed for illumination? Lamps burning whale oil were still the dominant source of home lighting, but the price of whale oil had been rising precipitously. Whale oil was extracted from uh, the blubber and oil of the spermaceti whale. And of course, the spermaceti whales were hunted extensively in the 1830s and 1840s, to the point that by the 1850s, the world herd, as it was accessible at the time, was very much depleted. And that, of course, drove the price of spermaceti whale oil, as they called it up. As a possible alternative to whale oil, Bissell, in 1854, sent a sample of the Pennsylvania oil to a chemistry professor at Yale for analysis. Three months later, the professor confirmed Bissell's wild dream. Your company have in their possession a raw material from which, by simple and not expensive processes, they may manufacture very valuable products. He discovered that through boiling the oil, it could be distilled into a high-quality illuminating fluid called kerosene, which burned with a clean, bright flame. Bissell and his partner, New Haven banker John Townsend, formed the Seneca Oil Company and acquired land in Pennsylvania. The problem they faced was how to get the oil in large enough quantities to create a kerosene market. The solution came from a bottle of make-believe medicine. While in a druggist shop one day in 1856, Bissell saw an advertisement for a miracle elixir, Kier's Rock Oil Medicine, that featured on its label a derrick used to drill water wells. Water distillers in Pennsylvania had long been plagued with the problem of oil seeping into their wells. It was this unwanted oil that Samuel Kier bottled and sold. In a giant leap of understanding, Bissell immediately grasped that drilling for oil might make sense. What they needed was someone to supervise the drilling of a well. Townsend suggested his friend, Edwin Drake. Edwin Drake was probably not the most obvious choice to drill what became the Pioneer Oil Well. He had been a purser on a steamboat, he had been a conductor on the New Haven Railroad and so on. I think his major qualification for the job was that he needed work at the time. When it was announced that this well would be drilled for the express purpose of finding oil in the area there, people, uh, Drake became a laughing stock. Everybody laughed at him. So in order for his backers to give him some credibility, all of the mail that went into him had the, had the title Colonel on it. 
So when the postmaster starts, oh, he's a colonel. So he was known as Colonel Drake. In the spring of 1859 in Titusville, Pennsylvania, Colonel Drake hired a local blacksmith named Uncle Billy Smith, and they began drilling for oil. As the months passed, they hit water, but nothing else. The oil industry's first well seemed destined to be the oil industry's first dry hole. As they saw their few thousand dollars draining down Drake's well, the investors grew increasingly wary. Finally, in August 1859, Townsend sent Drake the last of the money and told him to close up the operation and return home. Townsend's letter arrived on Monday, August 29, 1859, but to his everlasting gratitude, it was one day too late. For on Sunday, the 28th, with the well at 69 and a half feet, Edwin Drake looked down the hole and saw something dark floating to the surface. When he asked what it was, Uncle Billy answered simply, that's your fortune. The oil age had just begun. The well produced 35 barrels of oil a day. Each barrel held 40 gallons and they sold it for $40 a barrel, almost $700 a barrel in today's dollars. Within days, the first oil boom was underway. The population of Titusville quadrupled overnight and land prices skyrocketed as trainloads of newcomers converged on the town with money in their hands and greed in their hearts. Little more than a year later, Titusville had 75 wells producing oil and 15 refineries distilling kerosene. A local newspaper editor wrote of the period, the oil and land excitement in this section has already become a sort of epidemic. It embraces all classes and ages and conditions of men. They neither talk nor look nor act as they did six months ago. Land leases, contracts, refusals, deed arrangements, interests, and all that sort of talk is all they can comprehend. Among those who got rich were investors George Bissell and John Townsend. Among those who didn't, was Colonel Edwin Drake. A poor businessman, Drake did not patent any of his inventions, like the sinking of a stovepipe down the well to hold water out and keep the well from collapsing. What money he did make, he lost in bad investments and died a virtual ward of the state, bitter about the fortunes others had amassed from his discovery. It was written of him when he died. He shook the boughs for others to gather the fruits. Drake's discovery in western Pennsylvania lit up the globe. Today in the 20th century, it's hard to imagine the impact kerosene could have on the world of the 19th century, but it revolutionized society. As large amounts of oil were pumped up from the underground reservoir Drake had tapped, virtually overnight, kerosene became the dominant source of home illumination in America and Europe. You probably bought it from a street vendor if you lived in a city. If you lived in a small town, as a lot of Americans still did, you almost certainly bought kerosene at a general store. Compared to $5 a gallon for whale oil, kerosene prices varied from 10 to 25 cents a gallon. From Drake's 35 barrels a day in 1859, the Pennsylvania oil region was only three years later shipping out more than 8,000 barrels of crude oil a day. Huge refineries opened up in major cities along the rail lines where the oil was sent. By 1865, Cleveland alone had 30 refineries. Like the rest of the burgeoning young oil industry, refining too was a rough and tumble cutthroat business. And no one was more perfectly suited to it than a young Cleveland businessman who owned the city's largest refining plant. His name was John D. Rockefeller, and his dark genius for the oil business would soon make him the richest and most reviled man in America. John D. Rockefeller got into the oil business with a dry goods wholesaling partner in, uh, during the Civil War. Uh, got into it in a small way with a fairly conventional refinery, disposing of most of his goods in the immediate vicinity of Cleveland. By relentlessly pouring profits back into his business, Rockefeller expanded to a second refinery, then to an export business to service Europe. He bought boats, tanker cars, storage facilities, 
Finally, in 1870, he consolidated all his businesses under one name, the Standard Oil Company. By that point, Rockefeller already controlled one-tenth of the entire American refining industry. But that wasn't enough. He wanted nothing less than to control it all. In the 1870s, Rockefeller's pursuit of industry control set a new standard of ruthlessness. Bribery, extortion, collusion, and intimidation were just some of the weapons he used. Those competitors he couldn't take over, he drove out of business. By 1880, Standard Oil controlled 90% of the nation's refining capacity. By 1890, John D. Rockefeller was the wealthiest man in America. He moved to New York, dividing his time between an opulent Manhattan townhouse and a vast estate in the country north of the city. But acquiring that level of wealth had also made Rockefeller one of the most feared and hated men in the country. Mothers warned their children to be good, or Rockefeller will get you. Uh, Rockefeller really became a popular target, uh, largely because he had very little sensitivity to what we today would call public image or public reputation. Public opinion was certainly that he was an avaricious, ruthless kind of person. But as Standard Oil's stranglehold on the industry grew, so did assaults on Rockefeller's monopolistic practices. In 1904, immediately after his election, President Teddy Roosevelt launched an investigation of Standard Oil. Two years later, the government brought suit against the company under antitrust provisions. Roosevelt called Standard's executives the biggest criminals in the country. The case was in the courts for five years, but in 1911, while he was hunting big game in Africa, Roosevelt got the good news. Standard Oil would be dismantled into numerous smaller companies. Rockefeller had lost his monopoly for good. The breakup of Standard Oil hardly meant the end of massive fortunes to be made from oil, especially since a market a hundred times larger than kerosene was about to emerge. America was about to go car crazy. Refining kerosene had always left producers with a hazardous and unwanted byproduct that was usually just pumped into pits and burned. It was called gasoline. But in garages all over Europe and America, inventors were tinkering with something known as the internal combustion engine. And gasoline turned out to be just the right fuel to put it on the road. By the turn of the century, the automobile was a major sensation, said Frank Phillips, founder of Phillips Petroleum. I think people are going to buy quite a passel of these little gasoline buggies, and they need gasoline to make them go. It may be the thing of the future. Automobile registrations, which numbered 8,000 nationwide in 1900, skyrocketed to 900,000 12 years later. The market for gasoline was suddenly enormous, and new supplies of oil were desperately needed to fill the tanks of these new tin lizzies. New oil fields were discovered in West Virginia, Ohio, and Indiana. Near the turn of the century, a large field was discovered in Southern California, and by 1910, California led the world in oil production, most of it controlled by the Union Oil Company. And the oil fields became a backdrop for the new movie industry developing in Hollywood. But all this oil still wasn't enough to quench the insatiable thirst of the automobile. What the world needed was a huge new source of oil, and the man who would give it to them was Patillo Higgins. A one-armed lumberman from Beaumont, Texas, Higgins was fascinated by an area outside Beaumont known as Big Hill, where sulfur water and gas seeped up through the soil. Higgins believed there was oil to be found there too. He just had an idea. It was a hunch. Let's call it uh, divine if you want to. In fact, in the early days, more oil and gas was found by people drilling by the seat of the pants than there were by geology and geophysics. Till that time, the oil that had been tapped was found between the Earth's surface and the first thick layer of underground rock. But Higgins believed there could be oil underneath that rock, oil under great pressure, great enough to force up the gases Big Hill was known for. 
The geologists he brought to the site all dismissed Big Hill as oil field material. And in seven years of trying to prove them wrong, Higgins had nothing but three dry holes to show for it. They put an ad in the paper about if he wanted to drill this well, where it was and everything else, and he only got one reply, and that was from uh, Anthony Lucas. Anthony Lucas was a mining engineer and former captain in the Austrian Navy who thought Higgins might be right. He formed a group of investors giving Higgins 10% as a finder's fee and in October of 1900 began drilling in an area of the hill known as Spindle Top Heights. The type of drilling system Lucas and Higgins used was known as a rotary rig and is essentially the same drilling system used to find oil today. This derrick is used to support the weight of, of the drilling pipe. Uh, as you drill, uh, you're coming in and out of the hole and you need a, a huge block and tackle, essentially what it is, that will pull this pipe out and pull up new joints to screw in to make deeper hole. So you have to have a very, very strong derrick to support that weight. When, when they're drilling these wells, they have a bit on the end of the pipe. And, uh, they start to hold and go down, and every time they want to make a deep, uh, go deeper, they just screw on another 30 foot of drill pipe. And uh, they just keep turning to the right, and the, the mud goes down the center of the pipe, goes through the bit, and out to outside in, in between it and where it has cut the hole. So it will take out the cutting. Using a steam powered drill and crew of four, Lucas hit solid rock at 900 feet, the rock that Tillo Higgins believed sat on top of the oil. With new drill bits designed for boring through rock, Lucas pushed on, past 1,000 feet, then 1,100 feet. On January 10, 1901, at 1,160 feet, the bit broke through the rock. Suddenly, the well began spitting up mud, then lengths of the drill pipe itself, plus gas and rocks, and then, finally, oil, too, began shooting up into the sky with tremendous force. 150 feet high. It was pandemonium. Everybody went crazy. Lucas was in his in his home, and he was he he somebody came running up to the house and said, "It's in! It's in! It's in!" And there was a man that was working in the rice fields nearby, and he turned around to his fellow worker. And he said, my God, what a gusher. And that was the first time the word gusher was applied to that well or any other well. It took the drill team a while to understand what was happening because there had never been a gusher before. In previous wells, oil had always flowed meekly or been pumped to the surface. But this was oil under pressure immense pressure, just the way Patillo Higgins envisioned it. There had been some relatively big wells in Pennsylvania, but big wells usually meant 5,000 barrels a day. A spindle top came in massively on, on January 10th of 1901. The amount of oil produced that first day is usually stated at about 100,000 barrels. Within two days of the strike, more than 10,000 people came to Beaumont to see the largest oil strike in history and to launch a land and oil boom that put Titusville to shame. Four acres of land that sold for $60 one month were resold for $100,000 the next. It was hard not to get rich. By year's end, there were nearly 500 more gushers on Big Hill. Lucas sold out for $400,000 and 1,000 shares in the company his investors formed, which went on to become Gulf Oil and made Lucas extremely wealthy. Patillo Higgins had to sue to get his share and ended up accepting a settlement that brought him more than a million dollars. But he lost most of it the same way he earned it, searching for the next big strike. Patillo Higgins' great problem was that he had an imagination that was much vaster than his ability to control money. He really was a visionary. He was a kind of romantic, loose in American business. In a sense, he needed a bean counter. And had he had a bean counter, Patillo Higgins might have died rich. But when he died in 1955, Patillo Higgins wasn't bitter. Even though his money hadn't lasted long, 
He knew his name would live on forever. He had put Texas on the oil map. Patillo Higgins, Texas gusher sprayed 50,000 barrels of oil a day for nine days before the well could be controlled. In 1914, the world went to war. At first, it was fought in much the same way all previous wars were, by infantry troops who marched to battle. But by the time the United States entered the war in 1917, the face of war was changing. The biggest change of all was brought about by oil. The world's first tanks took to battle in 1916. Trucks took over from trains as the primary mode of troop transportation. And the war pushed the development of the airplane from a mere object of curiosity to the forefront of technology. In its year and a half in the war, the U.S. sent 50,000 gasoline-powered vehicles to France and produced 15,000 planes. When the war ended, Britain's Lord Curzon declared, The Allied cause had floated to victory upon a wave of oil. American oil and hardly any other made up that wave of petroleum on which the war was won. After the war, demand for gasoline and thus for oil continued to surge, and production barely kept up with demand. New sources were desperately needed, and once again, one of the oil industry's most unlike characters would step forward to deliver it. Not with just another strike, but with the biggest of them all. His name was Dad Joyner, a 70-year-old Texas oil man who had nothing going for him but nerve and luck, and most of that bad. With little income after years of one dry hole after another, Dad mostly lived off the kindness of well-to-do widows, whom he cultivated throughout Texas, said Dad. Well, every woman has a certain place on her neck, you see, and when I touch it, <laughs> they automatically start writing me a check. He was a good man. Uh, really, he was. He might have, he might have uh, romanced all of them, and... Uh, at 72 years old, I give him credit for doing whatever he could. He was a, a promoter, let's, let's face it, and he would promote enough above the cost of the well to always keep some in his pocket. One of Joyner's widows, Daisy Bradford, owned a farm in Rusk County in East Texas that Dad thought might hold oil, and in 1927, he began drilling for it. Geologists and oil experts told Dad there was no chance oil would be found there. But like Patillo Higgins before him, Dad just had a good feeling about the site, often paying his workers with dubious shares in future profits. He drilled for three years using beat up and borrowed equipment. In September 1930, there was a sign that Dad's luck might finally be changing. At 3,500 feet, the crew hit sand that seemed to have oil in it. A month later, on October 3rd, a gurgling sound could be heard from the well. The drilling crew chief shouted to the crowd, put out your cigarettes, quick. With a roar, oil began spouting over the top of the derrick. Dad Joyner had finally found black gold. Not only that, it was a spectacular find an oil field that proved to be 45 miles long and five to 10 miles wide. It dwarfed Titusville, Spindletop, and Southern California put together. The field turned out to be, uh, well, proportionate to a significant part of the whole state of Connecticut uh, in the end. Uh, truly massive in extent and also in production. It has produced today close to seven billion barrels of oil. There was nothing like it. It's the largest discovery at that time in the entire Western Hemisphere. Seven months after Dad hit it big, a thousand wells had already been drilled, and the East Texas oil field, now known as the Black Giant, was producing 500,000 barrels a day, the equivalent of enough gasoline to drive to Jupiter. Dad Joyner made one and a half million dollars on his find, and in true to form manner, he spent every penny of it searching vainly for another black giant, and romancing a long string of young women. When he died at age 87, he was living on donations from others he had helped make rich. <laughs>
the East Texas strike jolted geologists out of their complacent belief that finding oil was simply a matter of identifying the correct surface features. And it ushered in a new era of advances, many of which came directly from new technology developed during World War I. The two most important were the airplane and the seismograph. With the airplane, the geologists took in much broader perspective of surface geology than they could get from the ground. Photogeology really is what it was, and they would use it, and then they would send geologists on the ground to look at these areas. So uh, aerial photography has been important in the oil industry. I don't think it's, it's used now in satellite uh, photography, that uh, they're using it worldwide to look at, uh, you know, the, the big picture. The seismograph, which measured shock waves passing through the earth and was originally developed to monitor earthquakes, was used during World War I to pinpoint enemy artillery batteries. After the war, geologists discovered they could set off explosive charges and record the energy waves that bounced back on the seismograph. The form of these waves helped them plot the shape and depth of underground formations. Just as oil had powered the war, the innovations of the battlefield were now helping produce more oil. But as the 1940s approached, the pendulum was about to swing back again to war. And whoever controlled the oil could control the battlefield. John Wilkes Booth and two partners formed the Dramatic Oil Company to drill for oil. Six weeks after Booth shot President Lincoln, his well struck oil. World War II was a mechanized war, the likes of which had never been seen. Armies no longer moved on their stomachs. They moved in huge fleets of tanks, trucks, jeeps, ships, and planes. And keeping them moving required oceans of gasoline and oil, most of it from Dad Joyner's East Texas Black Giant. The Battle of the Atlantic is being fought with oil and will be won by oil. But a serious problem was getting that oil from the Lone Star State to the industrialized East, where the major war plants and shipping yards were, and to the European theater itself. The very problem that the United States had in 1940-41 uh, was that with the beginning of the European War, Germany began submarine warfare in uh, the area off the Texas Gulf. And uh, they did destroy a number of tankers. They made it very risky and very dangerous to try to ship very, very much crude oil or finished product in that particular way. Extra trains went to work running tanker cars round the clock to keep the oil flowing. But it still wasn't enough. With the fate of the war effort hanging in the balance, the nation's oil men made a daring proposal. They wanted to build the biggest and longest pipeline on the face of the earth two feet in diameter, large enough for a man to crawl through, and running all the way from Houston to New York. They called it the Big Inch Pipeline. But the $70 million cost and the massive allotment of wartime steel made it a difficult proposal to sell in Washington. Steel was a strategic commodity at the time. If you look within the regulatory parts of the government, there was a kind of war going on internally in America between parts of the economy that wanted supplies and materials and the people who wanted to promote Big Inch Little Inch were competing with the people who were building tanks and so on. It took a year, and the final and best argument came in the form of Nazi torpedoes. By early 1942, German subs were sinking an average of three tankers per day. In August 1942, an army of 15,000 workers began the Herculean task of building a 1,200-mile-long pipeline over rivers, swamps, and mountain ranges. It was a demanding task and on an impossible timetable. Routes were surveyed and cleared. Trenches three feet wide and four feet deep were dug. Forty-foot sections of pipe were welded together in the trenches and then covered. The work went on in even the harshest of winter weather. The pipeline was pushed north at record speed, almost four miles a day, from Houston to Illinois, then east to Philadelphia and New York. On New Year's Eve 1942, barely four months after construction began, the first oil was fed into the pipeline. So desperate was the need for oil that the last leg of the line hadn't even been completed yet. But it took three and a half days for the oil to travel the 1,254-mile length of the pipe. And by the time the first oil arrived, 
the last leg was in place and waiting. With so much of the country's oil output diverted to war, consumers at home faced shortages. Because of the necessity of diverting tankers to satisfy and fulfill the requirements of the Army and Navy, your government has found it necessary to ration gasoline on the eastern seaboard. But consumers' patience would be rewarded with not only an Allied victory, but with a revolution in post-war consumer goods. It would come from oil scientists whose contributions to the war were as great as any soldiers. Much as gasoline was a byproduct of kerosene production, substances like ethane, propane, and benzene were byproducts of gasoline production. And in laboratories across the country, scientists experimenting with these new substances called petrochemicals turned them into new products, plastic, synthetic fibers, bonding cement. When U.S. bombers attacked Tokyo, their radar cables were shielded with a newly developed substance called polyethylene. When Allied paratroopers landed behind the lines at the beaches of Normandy, their parachutes were made of nylon. Probably the most uh, well-known consumer products were nylon, orlon, and all of the related kinds of fibers. To provide material that had very high tensile strength and very low weight, uh, something that you couldn't do with cotton. You wouldn't really want to jump, jump out of a military plane at a great height in a cotton parachute, for example, with cotton harnesses and so on. So there were really special operational problems that synthetic fibers ultimately addressed during the war. And after the war, turning these new products into consumer goods for a victorious, baby-booming new leisure class made the petrochemical industry the growth industry in America. In fact, from hula hoops to home carpeting, Americans embraced this new technology with vigor, and petrochemical sales averaged a 10% annual increase every year for well over two decades. The post-war baby boom meant millions of new mouths to feed, and oil-based fertilizers and pesticides made possible the agricultural advances to feed them. But all this, plus the new generation of gas-guzzling luxury cars, created yet another massive change in the oil industry. Demand so far outstripped supply that by the 1950s, America could no longer supply its oil needs itself. The new source for oil for the world was the Mideast. In 1938, a standard oil of California exploratory well in Saudi Arabia came in big. That same year, drillers hit a massive find in Kuwait. With post-war development of these enormous oil fields, vast quantities of cheap oil was soon pouring out of the Mideast. But getting it to America in the quantities now needed posed a major problem. The oil tankers of the time were simply too small. The first oil tanker was built in 1886 and had a capacity of 300 tons. Tanker size increased gradually to about 300 feet and 10 to 15,000 tons and stayed there until after World War II. But the post-war increases were nothing short of astounding. In 1950, the largest tankers in the world were 500 feet long and had a capacity of 25,000 tons. By 1975, they were 1,400 feet long, almost five football fields, with a capacity of 500,000 tons. The oil is held in numerous compartments designed to give the ship stability. They also have double hulls for protection against punctures in case of accidents. The tankers are fully computerized and operate with a crew of only 20 to 25, one-third the number of men Columbus needed on his tiny flagship, the Santa Maria. Today's tankers have grown so huge, they often can't even come to shore. There aren't piers big enough or harbors deep enough to hold them. They anchor offshore and disgorge their oil through flexible pipelines, either directly to land-based storage facilities or to smaller vessels which can dock onshore. But since the 1980s, tanker production has slowed down somewhat. The OPEC oil embargo of the 70s and the resulting gas shortage in America launched a new emphasis on energy conservation. At the same time, the largest new field since Dad Joyner's Black Giant 
was discovered on the north slope of Alaska. The building of the 800-mile-long Alaska Pipeline, some of it built on stilts to allow caribou to pass below it, brought massive new quantities of homegrown black gold into the American market. But even with the bounty of Alaska's Prudhoe Bay, oil men are still looking toward the sea for more oil. Not for the next approaching tanker, but for a black harvest from the ocean floor itself. In California, Texas, Louisiana, major oil strikes were hit in coastal areas and nearly everyone in the industry assumed there was oil to be found offshore. But until the late 1940s, no one really believed there was any way of getting it. As early as the 1890s, oil men in Southern California had drilled off short piers. But the idea of going farther out to sea was scoffed at, especially by the major oil companies. For them, there was still plenty of oil on land, and they weren't about to take a costly gamble looking for it offshore. And that was just fine with Robert Kerr and Dean McGee, partners in a small Oklahoma independent oil company. Started in 1929, Kerr McGee needed an edge to compete with the already established major oil companies, so they looked to the sea. 80% of all of the oil that ever found in the world was found by independents, believe it or not. And we've drilled 80% of the, of the wells. Major companies, they have their way of thinking, and they just felt like they didn't want to do anything unless it, they, it was proven. But Kerr McGee was run by a geologist by the name of, of McGee. Dean McGee had an idea that oil would be found in the Gulf of Mexico. In 1945, Kerr McGee began underwater seismic testing on the ocean floor in the Gulf. There was not a single piece of equipment designed for offshore drilling. So when they picked two likely sites, Kerr McGee improvised the technology as they went along and built the world's first two offshore oil platforms in 18 feet of water, totally out of sight of land. Surplus vessels purchased from the Navy and anchored alongside served as crew quarters. Once the platforms were built, the drill heads were simply lowered into the water till they hit bottom and drilling through the ocean floor began. Two and a half weeks later, on one of the platforms, ten and a half miles off the coast of Louisiana, a crewman reported oil coming back with the mud. Misunderstanding, his boss told him to get a skimmer and skim it off. Skim it off, hell, he replied. There's barrels of it. It was a beautiful Sunday morning, October 4th, 1947, and suddenly the oil industry had entire new oceans to conquer. Despite the fact that an offshore well cost five times more to drill than on land, within two years there were already a score of platforms in the Gulf, and the new sea creatures were soon appearing on both the Pacific and Atlantic shores as well. By the mid-1960s, platforms were reaching as far as 30 miles out to sea, and by the 1970s, 100 miles. Today's platforms are true marvels of engineering. Crews on a single platform may drill 50 or more wells over time. More than 100 workers may live on the rigs, which operate on round-the-clock schedules. The oil is usually piped directly to waiting tankers that moor nearby. The workers typically stay for two-week shifts at a time, and the rigs are designed to be completely self-contained housing units featuring huge 24-hour kitchens, self-service laundromats, and even such landlubber amenities as movie theaters to break the monotony. And unlike those first Kerr McGee platforms, oil men today aren't just drilling in shallow waters. When Shell Oil wanted to explore one of its offshore Gulf sites, it was faced with the problem of how to drill in water almost 1,400 feet deep. Their solution? the world's largest oil platform, 1,615 feet tall, 161 feet taller than the world's highest skyscraper, the Chicago Sears Tower. Not only was this an unheard of feat, the site 150 miles southwest of New Orleans was so inhospitable 
that the platform would have to be designed to withstand 140 mile an hour winds and hurricane waves of 70 feet. The project began on dry land in Corpus Christi when workers welded together 77,000 tons of steel to form the jacket, the legs and base structure the platform itself rests on. The leg supports alone are 10 feet in diameter, large enough to drive a car through. But building it on dry land was only the first step. The next problem was how to get it to the offshore site. It would have to be towed, and that meant they had to build the largest barge ever constructed, with a deck area equivalent to an aircraft carrier. And even then, several hundred feet of the big rig stuck out over both ends of the barge. Once at the site, workers slipped the jacket, which was equipped with flotation devices, into the sea and slowly lowered it into position. It covered at the base four and a half acres of ocean bottom. Huge underwater pile driving hammers then drove 28 piles into the seabed to anchor the platform. Some reaching more than 400 feet into the ground. Engineers monitored the whole process through TV cameras mounted on remote-operated underwater vehicles. The deck area, 38,000 square feet of it, which was also built on land, was then fitted on top. The platform was designed to hold as many as 60 wells, reaching as deep as 18,000 feet below the ocean floor, with a yield of 44,000 barrels a day. Total cost? five hundred million dollars and that doesn't include the thirty five million dollars Shell paid the government to lease the underwater land. Today more than one-third of the world's entire production of oil comes from the sea a percentage that will continue to rise as technology makes it possible to go after undersea fields in even deeper water. Shell is drilling a well in the Gulf of Mexico and twenty eight hundred and sixty feet of water. Technology will improve while we're going to be drilling in 5,000 feet of water. I won't live to see today, but I bet you they'll be drilling in 10,000 feet of water. In the 140 years since Edwin Drake discovered the greatest source of energy the world has ever known, the oil industry has changed immensely. But the men who make up that industry have hardly changed at all. The lure of oil has always drawn a special breed of adventurer, part businessman, part riverboat gambler, part scientist, part snake oil salesman. But with an indomitable spirit and a doggedness to pursue the siren song of black gold wherever it is heard. As long as there is a need for petroleum, and as long as it is possible to hunt for it. It will not only be searched for, but it will be produced. And irrespective of where it is found, it will be brought to market if it is needed. It isn't just the money that comes with oil, although the degree of riches some have found is almost unimaginable. But there's more to it than that. It has to do with sinking a well into the unknown, making a financial and emotional gamble that comes up empty time after time, chasing the elusive till one day you find it. And the thrill of that one single moment is what will always keep the search for oil alive. I've been right there many times. And I've seen when, you, when we take a core for the first time and you pull it out and you know you got a well and you smell it and you push it into your face, there's nothing, nothing will beat that, nothing. It's the most exhilarating, fantastic, emotional feeling you possibly